Uh, my name is Ken Andrews, and uh, before any of you ask me sophisticated, sophisticated questions about postcard collecting, uh, the reason I collect postcards is because of the story on the postcard or the connection to something historical. I'm not worried about the perfect corners or uh, I, all the grading of cards or that sort of thing. Some of my favorite cards are really hammered cards, uh, but there's a story that goes with them. I have, uh, I have some slides that go along. This is only the second time I've ever used this setup, so bear with me if I do something out of sync or whatever. But penny postcards, called penny postcards, not because they were a penny each, but because the stamp was a penny. Okay. Originally, they appeared in uh, 1873, and uh, prior to that, it was illegal to send a private postcard. Uh, this is the type of postcard that originally was uh, offered. You could write on the same side, and uh, I guess it was easier for everybody to know your business. Uh, but that, that type of uh, postcard was at, at first. In 1907, they started uh, to divide the postcards. And uh, where on the back, there would be a place to write your message, and then the address you could put on that. And as some of you may remember, we got into the 30s, and they came along with what's called linen postcards. And uh, I think these are the most beautiful postcards because they really, you can see the linen in them. And uh, they're the ones that were sent by the rich people back to us who couldn't afford to go on vacation like they, they did. And they were, it was an easy way for them to brag about where they were. Uh, but uh, I think they're really, really pretty. Here you see a plane going across the, uh, over the Golden Gate Bridge. Probably some people flew underneath it. Indianapolis 500 and then a typical New England scene. For a moment here, I'm going to take a break and we're going to do some work. Um, before I do that, though, I want to tell you why I started collecting them. People have asked me how I got into it. Well, I'm a visual learner. I'm one of those people who learns by seeing somebody do it. And uh, uh, for me, uh, I love history, traveling, pictures and stories have always gotten um, my interest up. I'm into genealogy and antiques and detective stories, and I particularly love the 30s and 40s. Um, and I spent a lot of time learning about World War II because uh, the people in World War II were my heroes. Um, yeah, along the way, I've developed into kind of returning to sender. I've had three uh, postcards that uh, World War II GIs sent home to their girlfriends or families that I've been able to get back to them by searching them out on the internet. And, uh, uh, you know, with some really interesting and heartwarming results. Uh, one thing I like uh, more than uh, anything else is a beautiful handwriting. And sometimes not only you get wonderful handwriting, but you get some very interesting original poetry on these cards. So again, it's not so much the card that I'm interested in as the person who's sending it and why they're sending it. Okay? Uh, that's where I'm going to put you to work right now. Now, I want you to work in groups of two or three, all right? Now, those people sitting at the seats, I've got some paper back here. Uh, uh, you can either, somebody can come back and get it or I can deliver it to you. Some scrap paper. And what I want you to do on that scrap paper, I'm going to hand every group of two or three people a postcard. And this postcard has got a message on it. Now, I know... There are probably a lot of people like me are a little bit challenged with their eyesight. So I've got three. I brought three uh, <laughs> spy glasses. Uh, I didn't know there'd be this many tables. I'll leave one at every other table, and then you maybe can share it with uh, everyone. Because some of the handwriting is a wee bit wee. All right, I'm going to give you a postcard, and I want you to uh, take a look at that postcard and read the message on it. Now, don't worry about offending someone, because most of these people have long since gone, okay? <laughs> now, I'll give one to every two or three people. 
So I'll leave uh, maybe three at this table. And uh, you and your partners are to figure out what the message is, which isn't too hard in most of them. But then I also want you to uh, write down three ways to explain more of the story that you just read. In other words, you are the person sending this, and what were the parts of the stories you didn't include? Your job is to uh, read the message and then expand on it with two or three ideas. What's the story behind the story? And you've got about five more minutes to get that done. What's really going on with this person? And, or what else would they say if they had more space? This is a timed test, you know. The pressure's on. Okay, uh, you'll see there are lots of varieties. There's the wish you were here cards. In this one, you'll see the... Uh, some people who went to Paris or France or uh, on the Rhine, and they're writing back uh, to tell you how great it is, and they w wish you were here, maybe, with them. And then there were uh, political ones. You see uh, Williams Jennings Bryan running for president, and a couple of other uh, politicians are having a party. And then there's some other ones Social movements, see the temperance movement. In case you can't read it, maybe I can. <laughs> Atten Attention, boys and girls, of greater worth than riches, pearls, to pledge themselves to do their best, to work with vigor, vim, and zest. That shall not rid our land, and that right soon, of the unjust things the licensed saloon. Now, think of uh, somebody's going to send this to a friend. You know, or, uh, these are messages are, they want lots of people to read, I think. Then we have historical ones, uh, just a, Brooklyn, a scene in Brooklyn, a street scene, and then that other fellow you might recognize, uh, yeah, Charles Lindbergh, and uh, becomes an instant hero by risking his life. Oddities. Have you ever seen one of these? No. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's big vegetables or something like that, you know. <laughs> now those are big chickens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got one in Photoshop I'll show you later. All right, and then you have the holiday ones. Now you're not going to see these people and you're not going to go to a party at their house, but you're going to send them a card to remind them. And I was surprised, or I, at least I am surprised, how big a celebration the 1st of uh, January was. Uh, there's so many cards, postcards from the 1st of January, celebrating the new year. I think they probably wanted to get rid of the last year. Now, these, I think, we start to really get into art of it. Beautiful uh, pictures. And uh, again, I, I remarked before about the poetry, yes. Approximately what year were we talking These are 1910, 1911. Until the First World War, all of the uh, coloring and artwork was done in Germany. And when you have colored po postcards of uh, beautiful scenes from around here, they were sent to Germany, colorized and sent back. And then something happened about that time and interrupted that line. Yes. And Christmas activities. Now, this card up here on the left, uh, I bought it twice, okay? And t uh, years apart. And I bought it both times because I thought the kids are sweet. They look like the Campbell kids to me. And the second one I bought, though, had little, it's not this one, it had little X's up here and over here and down here. And I thought, wow, that's strange. And they were perfect. 
and come to find out it was the, the model, the, the number one card that the rest were made from. It was the model they used to produce it. And uh, this guy shows up a lot. He's that uncle who comes to the holidays. <laughs> okay, yeah. Now the, the military ones, these are kind of interesting, especially during World War II, you know, uh, these cards could be sent free, okay, and then the, instead of putting a stamp on the back, where the stamp goes, the guy would just put free. Of course, it was only a penny stamp anyway, so it wasn't going to break the bank, but it was on a limited budget. And there were all sorts of things. You have the, uh, the very uh, sexualized one, uh, the guy is uh, sending it home, usually he sends it to a buddy at home, not to his girlfriend, because he doesn't want to... <laughs> Or he sends a request. This one he can check off what he wants. This guy wants cookies from home. Okay. Or complaining about the training, which we all did. Then there's uh, advertising. Okay. These are companies that would advertise. Well, what do we have here? We have a seed store. We've got spools of thread. And a hotel. Uh, pretty inexpensive advertising. Uh, some more advertising. A car. Some potatoes. And go Canada Dry. Athletes, horses. Uh, who's that guy on the right? Anyone? Gary Lewis. Gary Lewis. No, Gary Lewis. This diamond ring? You know, he lives in Honeywell Falls now. Okay. Okay. All right, so uh, why did I get started? Well, it all starts with family. These three cards are, are uh, special to me. Down in the right hand side is the uh, small schoolhouse I went to as a kid. Uh, this is my grandfather's Percheron that he showed at the uh, State Fair, first Percheron in New York State. And up on the right is Civic Stadium in Buffalo, which uh, my oldest brother raced race cars at at one time. So those are things I've connected to my family that I wanted to have, have and save. And then there's the hometown, of course, and that's my hometown. And uh, you see, if you went back there now, it's just like a lot of other small towns, pretty much a ghost town in the middle. Yeah. South of Buffalo, near Kissing Bridge, that area? Springville? Didn't Springville. Oh, yeah. It's Pop Warner's hometown. Yeah. The hill. Yeah. And uh, I know, I don't know about, I think for most of us, we spent the first half of our life trying to get away from home and the second half trying to go back there. Okay. And I, I'm in a trying to go back there stage. Then we have some from right near here. You may recognize these places. Okay, a former business in town. Now, you're vis imagine you're visiting Rochester and you want to send something back that you think is the most important thing of Rochester. And obviously these uh, three people had different things in mind. Then we all like cowboys, Roy Rogers, uh, Tom Mix, whoever. Now that, these are real cowboys, the real ones. And on the right is real cowboy justice for a bad guy. Okay. Let's take a look at the 1930s. Um, yeah, I don't know. Oklahoma City. But I do have one of um, the Rochester Airport, the original Rochester Airport. Um, I, it's over near a uh, marketplace somewhere. Oh, okay. Uh, some, anyone, anyone? Highland, yeah, okay. And uh, those are uh, out there. 
you know, you may have a place that was really important when you were a kid and you, you long since forgot about it or got replaced by some other modern place and you can find those cards, okay? You, you might be able to find one that fits in maybe with an old picture you have of when you were a kid or when uh, you were a teenager or something like that. Okay, World War II. Now, uh, how many people uh, were in the service in here? All right, I want to thank you for your service, and you probably can remember when you would really want to have sent one of those cards to somebody. Uh, you know, away from home, a lot of times very young. Uh, this is the end of the war. Okay. Now, on the, uh, in the upper right, uh, that's in, uh, in the Netherlands, and they're celebrating. And this is in Paris, and uh, also celebrating. And I think for most of us, we can only imagine how thrilling that was. Um, but we can't forget history, and it's good to know how much they valued their uh, freedom. Then there's always kids. Okay. Now, I, I did, you know, if you bought a, a foreign postcard, like, see that little chef, that's all written in French. But if you have the internet, you can get translations, you just punch it in, and they'll translate what is written down there. So you don't have to speak the language to read the card. On the internet, they'll do a translation for you, free, of uh, what it says. Now we're getting into uh, what really hooked me here. A few years ago, I went to uh, Italy, and I saw uh, a scene that really struck me, and it, I said, gee, I think I got a postcard of that. And it was. This is the scene. I took the picture on the right, and I came home and found I already had that postcard. Somebody took the same picture. OK? So then I said, gee, the next time I go, I'm going to Take some with me, all right? And so this is from the Rialta. Oh, wow. Now, when I took this picture last summer, I think this lady thought I was taking her picture. <laughs> OK? And she was very happy to pose. Oh. Right. I, didn't, I didn't break her heart. Then everyone is taking the one on the right. That's my wife holding up the leading tower of Pisa. And on the left, I want to point out in this one uh, something that has changed. You see, this is like a fountain here, but back here there's a statue. Okay? In about 1850, there was a man who decided it would be a good idea to, to make Italy into one country. Okay? So they celebrated him in a statue, except this is in the north of Italy, in Bergamo, Bergamo, and the idea of being one country is not so popular there because they think the north is supporting the south. And so they kind of took down that statue of the guy who unified the country. Uh, yes, we hear that. Okay, this is in Milan, and this is the Galleria, built in uh, 1888. And still the same, you can see. And that's the cathedral. And uh, I really try to search out exactly the same spot to take the same picture. Uh, that cathedral, you can go on the roof and walk on the roof. They have services on the roof. It's a, a beautiful uh, cathedral. And then uh, this is in Parma, and that's the citadel. And I put my wife and my friends in the places where the people were standing. I, I told her, yeah, you have to bend your knees a little bit to be like that guy. <laughs> okay, and then Amsterdam. Uh, the Kalberstraat, I walked probably for 30 minutes to get this picture, because this is a walking pedestrian sales, uh, street of shops. And how did I find the right spot? Well, you see the bent pulley system? Now, in Amsterdam, the buildings are, are, are very narrow because you paid taxes by how wide your front of your building was. 
and so it also makes it difficult to get the, anything, appliances up to those apartments, so they have pulleys, they swing them up and pull them in through the window, okay? Well, apparently someone took up something that was really too heavy and it bent that pulley a hundred years ago because it's still bent now. <laughs> and I was able to locate the right spot for that picture. And on the right side, fortunately, somebody parked a boat in the spot I needed it parked to get that picture. More Amsterdam. It's a Rotterstraat, and this one, very cooperative uh, man there. Uh, here you have uh, a man stepping off the curb, and down here another man stepping off the curb. This is around the corner from the Anne Frank House. This is West Kirk, around the corner from the Anne Frank House. And over on the right is another example of how you get a sense that something's a good picture. I took that picture, then I came home and found that postcard. Whoa. Okay. Uh, and, that, and by the way, that postcard, this is one of the cheesiest postcards. You know, it's one of those you got in a pack, uh, they fold out, you know, and, and they're the lowest quality. But for me, it's a great picture, and it reminded me of the day I took, uh, took that picture. In Switzerland, uh, this is going up the mountain in Switzerland, that's the town of uh, Mirren, down below, of course, it was a rainy day when I was going up in the gondola. I couldn't get exactly the same shot, but it was relatively close. Over on the right, this very expensive hotel where everyone who was important stayed a uh, uh, hundred years ago, uh, but they modified it to add a Hooters. Uh, <laughs> so they, they altered it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, this is, uh, remember we talked about photoshopping? This is photoshopping 1910. Down be on the below is the uh, carousel, it's a casino. And I looked at the picture and I said, that's not like this postcard. This is the 100 year old postcard where they took the mountain from across the way and put it behind that to make a better picture. 1910 photoshopping. They moved them out. <laughs> That's when cut and paste was done with scissors. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're off to Austria. On the left is Berchtesgarten. You know, you've heard of uh, the, the guy who lived there once, right? Yeah. And uh, actually, his uh, retreat was on, I think, on that uh, lower mountain across the way, but I'm, I can't remember really because I was a little disoriented with it. But I was, uh, we were staying at a B&B, &B and we drove around the corner. I said, I think that's the picture. And so I parked the car and I looked at it and I said, yeah, that's a picture. That's a Berktisch Garden from a distance. Over on the right is Hallstatt, the beautiful lake. And that's near where um, the salt mines are where Hitler hid some of the art that he stole. Okay. Uh, that's in Hallstatt in Austria. Freiburg in Germany. You can see uh, some things never change. Uh, after World War II, in uh, Germany and other countries, uh, they had to decide, do we rebuild the way it was if it was bombed, or do we go to a new architecture? On, like Frankfurt, they went to all brand new stuff, but in other places, they, they had to build it. If they went with the old stuff, they had to have not only the same construction, but the same color, and the same setup completely. So you can go back into history with a walk. Munich. On the left-hand side, you can see the gate uh, uh, at Neuhausstrasse. And on the right is the Hofbrau House where Hitler had his first political rally. <coughs> Hungary, that's the parliament. And the second one over on the right is kind of a, what you call an Uncle Si. It's an almost, but not quite. I couldn't get to the place where that picture was taken, that's as close as I can get to it because some things have changed. The Cliffs of Moher in Ireland, and it, once again, this is one that I had taken the picture and then I found the postcard. I think pretty close. Barcelona. On the left, you're looking down the street of the uh, Paseo de Colón. At the end, that's Christopher Columbus pointing towards America. Uh, he's on top of that statue, and over on the right is the Sagrada Familia, Gaudi's uh, creation. He started building in 1926. They're still building it. 
It won't be finished. Gaudi, yeah? It won't be finished for another 20 years or so, and it's only done by donation. That's how they're... But the building is so big that you can't get a picture of it. The only ones I've ever seen the whole thing have been like from the air. It's enormous. Um, then uh, in France, and the Dordogne, um, we rented this house, which was the old post office, and stayed there. Uh, this is where the Hundred Years' War was fought, and there's um, five villages uh, on either side of that fought for 116 years, actually. And then a little town nearby called Mont Louis. Nothing's changed. Village of Lowe. I want to get a picture of some cows in front of that church. It was built in 1222. Well, there weren't any cows here, but you see there's a little cow crossing sign on the right-hand side. <laughs> and over on the right-hand uh, side, uh, you can see it uh, 100 years ago, uh, abject poverty. Now I can't afford to stay in that hotel. <laughs> Front, uh, Paris, where Harry met Sally on the left-hand side. This is from that bridge. On the right-hand side, uh, Place de la Concorde. And uh, Caddy Orsi, it was nice to have the tour boat arranged to come by just as I was taking a picture. <laughs> Timing is everything sometimes. Okay, um, I'm down to my last three, okay? And these three ha each has a story. This one, uh, you read the name of the person who wrote it? Clara Severide. Anyone remember anybody named Severide? Eric. Eric Severide. Well, this is a year before Eric was born. His mother, Clara, was writing a postcard to invite a friend over to the house. Okay? Now, I just was on the internet and I wanted to get one of a sod house. And I found it. It's not a very impressive card, except the name rang a bell. So then I look up the history of Eric Severide, and I don't know if you know, as a war correspondent, he, his plane was shot down, and he actually, with some other men, uh, were led out through uh, headhunter territory to escape. Okay, he came back. He was friends with Walter Cronkite, big-time newsman. Well, Eric uh, fathered two sons, and I go back to the internet and I punch in Eric Severide, get his son's name, punch in for addresses on them, and I find the name of one. It's a pretty unique name. Yeah, I mean, I've never run a name named Severide in, uh, the rest of my life. And uh, it was the name of a fellow near Philadelphia. So I send a letter to him. Gee, could this be uh, of, from your grandmother? And um, would you like it? And I, and I always put in, I don't want any money for it. I want to give it to you. But would you like it? Well, I got a letter back. And the son, that particular son is a, some sort of uh, international businessman. His, his wife called me back and said, yes, we want it. Um, and I sent it down to them. And it's that returner thing again. They were thrilled to have it, even though it's not a very impressive postcard, but it was something that their grandmother wrote the year before his, his father uh, uh, was born. Uh, this is what we call a hold to the light card. And I brought it with me later on. We can take a look at it. But a hold to the light card, uh, you hold it up, and those lights go on. Okay. There's a problem with them, though. Uh, what they painted with them. That was um, radium. Um, okay. Yeah, radioactive. Yeah. So you don't want to hold them too close for very long. You know? But, but hold to the light cards are outstanding. This is from a place in Amsterdam. I used to take soccer teams over to Europe, and uh, uh, this was uh, right across the street from the hotel we stayed at. So I, for a long time, wanted to get a hold to the light, and this one I was able to get one of a place that was really significant in my life. Now, who is Alba Root? Anybody know who that is? Now, there's a, there's a rock group now called Alba Root. That's not what I'm after. Okay. Alba Root was a vaudeville guy. Alba Root rode a bicycle on stage. Well, and he, I don't know what his condition was. I think probably post polio, his legs didn't work. So he rode a bicycle on stage, had, hooked up with these various braces he had, and did tricks on stage with a bicycle. And then he modified his act when the electricity got big, and he pretended to be a robot, okay? Well, anyway, Albert Root was a vaudeville guy. So I'm looking at it, and I said, gee, 
the other side has the address, and the address simply says Alba Root, Scala Theater, Copenhagen. I thought, wow, this had to be a big deal. Guy, if they can send a, a letter from the Netherlands to, to uh, uh, Copenhagen and just put his name in a theater on it. So I looked it up. He, uh, he toured in vaudeville, and uh, this card is from a, I, I went to the translation for the Dutch translation, and basically it's a girl in, make, inviting him to stop by, make sure he remembered he'd say he'd stop by when he got to Amsterdam. And I, I also went to uh, Google Maps and located where it was sent from, which is now um, a business site. Uh, so I feel like I know these people. <laughs> and online, Albert Ruth's grandson recently wrote about his life and, and uh, what he went through. And uh, I realized then that Albert Root was born in Rochester, which gives us another connection. Okay. The third one and last one uh, I bought because, again, I'm from Springville, New York, and it said, postcard, Springville, New York, old man uh, with a chauffeur. Okay. Apparently the guy didn't realize that the steering wheel was on the other side of the car then and that this old man is Pop Warner and that this is Pop Warner sending card back to Carlisle Indian School to tell him what a rough journey he had taking this fellow who was Louis Tawanama who was the other guy that went with Jim Thorpe to the 1912 Olympics and they were in my hometown training at the time. Okay. Uh, I would never part with that card. It cost me $12. I've gone on the internet in Las Vegas or selling autograph letters by Papa Warner for $7,000. This is a one of kind of card because it was made in a drugstore in my hometown. Okay. Now you can see though, because it is a photograph, it's deteriorating. Okay, so somebody didn't protect it before, but I am protecting it now. And uh, I took this one photocopy of it, but won't do any more photocopying of it. Okay, but that's my pride and joy. Not because it's significant to anybody else, but it's a guy from my hometown who was in the same line of work I was in, and I really appreciate it. In fact, next door to my brother's house is a family of relatives of his, and in their basement they have a lot of Pop Warner watercolors that are deteriorating because they're not caring for them. His original watercolors he did. He painted them. Yeah, he's a wonderful artist. Okay, uh, with that, I'm opening up to any question you might have that I might be able to answer, but I can't guarantee it. Well, I, I brought most of my collection with me in that blue book back here. Okay, uh, I've got probably probably 90 then and now things I've done with photographs and, and other places like I showed in part of it, but not a huge collection. There's just ones I really like, th things I care for. Uh, and a lot of them with uh, those Campbell Kid-like characters. And I do collect Valentine's uh, cards because uh, my wife's birthday's on Valentine's, so I can double dip if I get a birthday <laughs> card and put it down. <laughs> I'm cheap. <laughs> So, <laughs> I have a lot, yeah, isn't it very sensitive? But it's not a huge collection. And, but I do like to go to um, the shows, and there are, there's a, a, a Rochester club, and I think they meet up um, near Wegmans at uh, Rochester Postcard Club. There's a Buffalo Postcard Club. Um, I would say if you really want to get into, the, into collecting, it's like anything else, you, d you really should decide what you like and what you want because um, sometimes, I mean, it, I never, uh, I like antiques, but I don't buy anything I don't know, you know, because it's, it's just, you set yourself up for a fall. So I, I really have to know it before I do it. But you, it's a good way to learn about it. And you go to any show and they'll be happy to show them and they have many more than I have and lots of varieties and uh, uh, you can always deal with them, it almost always can bargain with uh, people selling them. Right now, today, yeah. I'm looking for cards uh, from the little villages where battles were in Normandy, which are hard to find. But that's because I'm going to Normandy for the ceremony on D-Day. And so 
I'm going to go back there, so I want to take some more pictures, then and now pictures. Again. But they're hard to find. And uh, uh, but other than that, uh, you know, if I see a, a cute one or you know something that's significant to me. Uh, other question, yeah. The oldest postcard that you have? Probably. Uh, I don't have anything much of anything goes uh, earlier than 1900. Uh, I don't think. I, um, and there really weren't a lot of them, and they aren't around. Yeah. How about embossed cards? Is there a demand for embossed? Uh, that's one that's, you're out of my uh, area. I, the, you can find out that answer, and I'm sure, um, you know, I, I would go to a show, and what I would do, when I go to a show and I'm looking for something new, I go to up to someone I've dealt with before, and I say, okay, I really want to know who around here knows this or is, is, knows that embossed cards. And they'll, no doubt, there'll be one person in that club that's their thing. Okay, and that, that's uh, how I would go about doing it. Yeah. I uh, heard a talk probably a year ago from somebody from, from that Rochester Postcard Club, and they came and the entire room was filled with postcards. I had absolutely no idea the vast array of types and sizes and ideas and there's just an amazing history of sure. postcards. However, I think your presentation was so fun because who, nobody, in, in all of his talk, he never said a thing about what's on the back. Mm -hmm. And that really makes it so much more interesting. Yeah, I, I, to me it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Is the best way to preserve the cards laminating them? Or is that no. But they, you those things, those sleeves I pass on those, I do a pretty good job, okay. And that's the way I would go. But I wouldn't laminate because then you then you would affect the the cover and people. I don't think they're going to be interested. In them. Yeah. And then um, now, as far as like collecting goes, is that um, does it take away from the value that they're written on the back? I don't think so. Now, I, there are people, obviously there are people who want uncirculated ones, I'm sure, but I don't, I don't ever see it, someone demanding that. And in fact, um, when I see that it's uncirculated, I ignore it. <laughs> and so, I don't know, I, I, I don't know what the, the, the choice is for other people, but, but I wanna know who sent it and why they sent it. Yes? I've got a whole album that my, from my grandmother and most of them, well, there was Valentine ones and the holiday. But one, it was before she was married that my grandfather wrote, be in Hornell on Thursday, see you then. It was, they didn't have telephone, they didn't have, this was. Yeah, but you also bring up another point that's significant. Um, I mean, the way you said that to me, we deal with people differently. And, and uh, you know, after going through women's rights and uh, things like this, the world changes. And some things you'll see, there are some cards that were sent 100 years ago that are pretty demeaning uh, to some people. You know, it, it's, uh, it's like, well, you're good for cooking or something like that, you know what I mean? <laughs> and you notice the times have changed when you see the type of cards that were popular, okay? And uh, some of the things we did, you know, like uh, May Day, celebrating putting the, the things on the doorknob, the little cones of, uh, Flowers or candies, they used to do that. Kids don't know what you're talking about now. But to get a card that showed that and you could share with someone young. See, I also think that we all really, really, really want to know where we came from and what our parents were like. Like, I'm sure many of you have the same experience I did after my parents passed. There were all these questions I want to ask them, okay? And I think it's important for us to gather things and explain them, and even if we don't show the, the, the to send it now, if it's in our stuff and they read through it, they'll know more about us and about what we were like. And, uh, I, well, that's just one, one way I would think that is really important. I mean, it's so nice to know that you have that. Well, this, I mean, it was like pre-telephone and everything, and that was the way he was from a different town, and I'll, you know, that's, I'm coming. Yeah, I, um, a number of ones I have, in fact, some of them I might have been what I passed out, will say, oh, well, uh, I'll be there uh, on the 1107 train, probably tomorrow. Uh, uh, I'm leaving the 1107 train. I'll probably make it there tomorrow or something. It's like, okay. Yeah. 
I have another question. Sure. I have this postcard here that was printed in Germany, and it was sent in uh, 09. Yeah. And if you look very carefully at the corners, the swastika. Yeah, and the swastika was a good luck sign, and it you know for thousands of years, and Hitler, Hitler grabbed it uh, because it was. And it actually came from the Norway, was it uh, was originated, uh, and uh, he borrowed that because he wanted it to be good luck for his his. Uh, didn't work for him. Yeah. yeah. The postcard that you had that had the glow glow windows. Yeah. Is that like you would hold it up to the light and then turn the lights off and it would glow in the dark? Yeah, I'll show you. Yeah. Okay, here are two of them. That's the one I have in there. And hold it up to the light, you'll see. Oops, hold it up, you'll see. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's a, uh, the cathedral in Cologne. It's the only thing that was, the GIs, when they bombed, they bombed around that cathedral to make sure they didn't destroy that. And you can we can pass it around. I, I, I want to, uh, you know, I I counted the number of cards I brought. Most of them are not valuable. These two are very valuable. But um, if you can't share things, what are they? Is that like layered, like something in between two pieces of paper? That I don't know. I know the windows are painted with what they used to paint on the on the uh, on the dials of a of a old uh, clock. You know, so you can, at night you can see it? Yeah. yeah, it's the same thing, radium. Now, one other thing I want to share with you, and I'll pass these around. I, I want you to take a look at some of the beautiful handwriting that people had. And maybe you have, uh, thank you. Maybe you can see the... Uh, If you take a look at the handwriting, people worked at their penmanship, and I appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, there was another one. Blouser or something. Blouser was one too. No, no, no. I was brought up on Palmer. Yeah. Zayner. Yeah. But. Okay, uh, with that, with that, that, could, that with uh, no more questions, that concludes uh, my program. I'll be around. I would like to collect all the cards when you get done.